On Kitchen Nightmares, there are plenty of nasty and cruel chefs and owners. It's part of the charm of the show. But there are a few who cross the line, like Joe Nagy, owner of Mill Street Bistro in Norwalk, Ohio. This man pushed Gordon Ramsay to his limit, and that's saying a lot. It was so hard to help save his business that it took two episodes to cover it all. I mean, how mad do you have to be to kick the owner out of his own kitchen? Without a doubt, one of the most delusional owners ever seen on the show. But it's been 10 years since that episode. Is Joe really as bad as they say? Or is that just an exaggeration? Was he able to keep his business afloat? Well, join me to find out. In the first part of the mini saga, we travel to the community of Norwalk, Ohio, where Joe Nagy, after losing his job, decided to go into business for himself, buying a livestock ranch and opening a bistro. At first glance, Joe seems like a passionate chef who is very confident in his cooking. But when there are no diners around, his true personality comes out, a very cruel and tyrannical one with his staff. Well, at least his food is good. Not at all. Joe insists he runs a fine dining restaurant but the food is far from even decent. It doesn't even look good. And it's kind of weird since all the ingredients come from Joe's ranch. If those ingredients are so fresh and delicious, why do the dishes look so off? My friends, Joe was lying. Many of his ingredients are kept in the freezer. But if that's bad enough, his manners are even worse. Joe humiliates his employees whenever he can and blames them for everything, ignoring that the reason his business is sinking is him. The Mill Street Bistro, a kitchen nightmare, by no means. See what I mean? Before stopping by the bistro, Joe invites Gordon to his ranch to show him his animals and how he takes care of them on his own. Well, with a little help from his goat, Skinny. Joe is so enthusiastic that Gordon catches a little of it. I'm dying to taste some of that passion. How do we tell him the truth? Gordon gets a good first impression of the bistro, as it's a nice, cozy place. When he orders his dishes, Gordon is surprised by the high prices, but thinks it's due to the farm-to-table format. While waiting, Ramsey asks all the staff to take off their name tags, as they are unnecessary as it's a unique restaurant. Finally, the first dish arrives, French onion soup prepared by Joe himself. But for Gordon, it's too greasy and barely has any onions in it. The next dish is Oyster Rockefeller, made with frozen oysters. Delicious. As soon as he hears Ramsey's opinion of the soup, Joe approaches his table to offer him another, but Gordon prefers to continue with the oysters, which he also ends up returning to the kitchen. He's arrogant, but with a sense of humor, I think. Gordon receives his third dish, scallops en croute, where he finds ridiculously small-sized carrots. He therefore immediately returns them to Joe, who by this point is losing patience. He's in the wrong place. This was definitely one of the hardest episodes for Ramsey. Speaking of him, he just sent back all the scallops on croute because the dough was raw and disgusting. And the last dish, elk quesadilla, doesn't escape either. I got one thing to say to this quesadilla. Adios. Ramsey usually orders four dishes, but this time he orders a couple more, like the vegetarian ravioli, which makes it obvious that the restaurant's ingredients come straight from our fridge. After that, we have the catch of the day, composed of three fried fish that are dry, rubbery, and greasy, and somewhat frozen. Finally, we finish with the elk medallions that are barely chewable due to their tough consistency, which will smash your teeth for a modest $35. Can you show me how to make it? I don't think he took that well. When Gordon goes to share his opinions with him, Joe surprises him with an arrogant attitude, claiming that this is the first time in his career that a customer refused his food. But we know how Ramsey is. He's not intimidated by anything, so he doesn't hesitate to make it clear to him that his food is pathetic and anything but fresh, while the staff enjoys the show. You're a small man with a fake bistro. He's right, as Joe claims he's not a certified chef, but he rules the kitchen and learned from the best chefs in Europe. Come on, man, do you even know how to cook? You have a gifted young group of servers that in the first 20 minutes of meeting them, then you have done all but no matter how many truths they tell him to his face, Joe still laughs like they were all wrong. Defensive? Ignorant? I'm all that, you're my twin. God, there are so many good moments in this episode. I can cook, Joe. Nah, Ramsey won. However, Joe is so proud that he doesn't care that Gordon is leaving, and just reminds his staff that they should keep doing their job. 
Ramsay returns to oversee dinner, noticing that there's a sign in the kitchen that literally screams, Quiet! Despite that work environment, the orders begin to roll out. But to Joe's disgrace, diners return the dishes gradually due to different factors, such as a rock inside a ravioli. After that, Gordon meets up with Teresa, a former bistro cook who got tired of being Joe's scapegoat. At the time, she was forced to resign, but now has revealing photos of the poor state of the food in the fridge. Joe, you're going down. Gordon confirms that in the storage room, where he finds bags of half-frozen meat, along with blue cheese, vegetables, shrimp, and of course, the famous oysters. Instead of explaining himself, Joe continues cooking like it's nothing, but Gordon stops him when he finds raw onion in a French onion soup. No need for Ramsay to tell you that's a bad idea. That's called common sense. That in your tiny mind is not common. In the second part of this nightmare, Gordon threatens to leave the bistro entirely, but Joe admits that he doesn't want him to leave. Also, he still doesn't recognize that the biggest problem in the business is his ego. Gordon has had big challenges in the past, but I dare say this is one where we've seen him the most stressed and frustrated. Although his efforts are producing results. I want this restaurant to be a quality restaurant. Wow, so it does have some soul after all. Thanks to that new perspective, Ramsey shows him a live broadcast from the staff in which everyone expresses their displeasure with their boss, from his anger issues to the way he humiliates his employees. But of course, when the diners arrive, Joe acts like the nicest, most charismatic guy. What they didn't expect, though, is for Joe to show up with a calmer and more supportive attitude, even admitting that he was mostly to blame for the problems, but that the others needed to change, too. Do I think he's gonna change? No. Sorry, Joe, but you deserve that. Ramsey then shows him a big market bag with vegetables, chops, and other fresh produce for only $89.73. And to think a couple can spend up to $100 on a couple of dishes from the bistro. Seeing that, Joe admits that his menu is too expensive and seems willing to cut costs. Though he also assures Ramsey that his staff doesn't want to sell a burger for as little as $10. Did the staff really say that? Of course not. Joe keeps using them as his scapegoat. But there's no time to waste. First things first. Teach Joe how to cook the new dishes. Much cheaper and made with fresh ingredients. No, Joe, it's not good bringing the produce from your ranch and then freezing it. Ramsey finishes by creating two new bistro specials, a simple but delicious walleye and a classic burger. That's the road to success, but will Joe be able to navigate it smoothly? Later, they start welcoming diners in for their taste of the specials. But as soon as they get the first orders, Joe can't remember the correct order to assemble the burgers, so Ramsey has to teach him once again. Didn't the European chefs teach you to memorize, Joe? And it looks like they didn't teach him how to take orders correctly either, because the entrees were ready before the appetizers. Also, the fish dishes were made without tickets, so they don't know where to send them. The culprit for that mess was Joe. But as usual, he ignores the others and keeps cooking. As Gordon tries to talk some sense into him, Joe just complains about getting orders and being told how he should cook. Here we go again. Come over here! Don't and tell me it's crispy! Wait, there's more. Then wake up! You wake up, idiot! Furious at Joe's attitude, Ramsey decides to kick him out of the kitchen and pass the baton to Chef Tom to finish the orders. What's worse is that Joe doesn't even leave the restaurant, but instead complains to the diners about Ramsey. There's a difference between passion and <laughs> And he's got a double dose of <laughs> Joe, you never learn. At the end of the day, while the diners enjoyed the meal, there's a tense atmosphere over the altercation with Joe, so Ramsey had no choice but to... You cannot be in that kitchen. The next day, Ramsey surprises everyone with a new menu for the relaunch, which, by the way, did not require renovations to the restaurant. If anything good can be said about the place, it's got a pretty nice interior. The staff loves the food, especially Joe, who has already accepted that he can no longer be in the kitchen for the sake of his business. For his replacement, Ramsey hires Brian Goodman, who comes from the Greenhouse Tavern, one of Cleveland's finest restaurants. Man, does a new chef make a difference, as the entire staff is in sync with his speed and delivers dishes on time. Meanwhile, Joe manages a role as a communicator between the kitchen and the tables, mostly helping the waitresses. But in his eagerness to cooperate, he ends up delivering some dishes to the wrong table, although Brian manages to prepare the replacement dishes in record time. Despite that, Joe has no problem taking the blame. And after the successful relaunch, 
Gordon congratulates him on his positive turnaround. He also makes him promise the staff that they will not allow their boss to return to his old habits. Man, your hard work. That's what you signed up for. <laughs> yes, yes, what a touching moment. But did Joe really embrace the changes so quickly, or was he just acting? What happened to the Mill Street Bistro after the show? It failed, that's what happened. Months after the episode aired, the Mill Street Bistro continued to welcome diners with Ramsey's menu, although there were some notable changes. Chef Tom and some waitresses left, so Joe had to return to the head chef position, and we all know what Ramsey thought about that. In early 2014, Joe rebranded the place as Maple City Tavern, looking to improve business, but the Yelp reviews just say otherwise. For the most part, the reviews are hateful comments towards Joe, but some were written by actual diners who didn't like their food at all. The Maple City Tavern hung on until March 2016, when Joe decided it was best to sell the entire building for $140,000. Although, according to Zillow, the property was sold in 2019 for $160,000. Today, the building is occupied by a steakhouse restaurant called The Press Box, which enjoys moderately good reviews on Yelp. But that wasn't the end of the story. What happened to Joe Nagy after the show? It's no secret that many owners on the show hold some resentment towards Ramsey after their participation on the show. But Joe took it to another level with a lawsuit for missing items and damages to the restaurant. According to him, Ramsey's film crew left without taking their cables and lighting fixtures installed in the ceiling. In addition, he reported the disappearance of a pot valued at $200 and a container of elk chops. In total, the claim came to over $1,000 and according to Joe, he was able to reach a settlement with Gordon's team. Beyond that, Joe doesn't have much social media involvement. The only thing you can find is a Facebook profile that parodies the chef with photos of unappetizing dishes and messages challenging Gordon Ramsay. Even though the episode was aired in 2013, the account is still posting memes. <laughs> As for the real Joe, there's only one photo of him at a Florida food festival in late 2018, where he was serving up his famous elk burgers. At that event, Redditor Real Estate Novelist had a chance to talk to him, describing him as a friendly retired cook who wanted to share his culinary prowess, but was still a bit of a show-off. And believe me, he doesn't have fond memories of Ramsay. And that's what we have on Joe Nagy, the most infamous guy on Kitchen Nightmares, who quite rightly has no social media. Good luck, Joe, wherever you are.